to the Middle Cut Podcast. Irish whiskey in conversation. Brought to you by Potstilled.com. Your one-stop shop for Irish whiskey news and interviews. Now, it's time for your hosts. Hello and welcome to the Middle Cut Podcast. Brought to you by Potstilled.com. This is Irish whiskey in conversation. Brought to you very kindly by our sponsors, irishmalls.com, your one-stop shop for all things Irish whiskey. Gin and pushings delivered straight to your door. We're legal to do so, but check them out on irishmalls.com. As I said, my name is Matt Healy from potstill.com, but I am joined by another Matt, Matt another Jones, Matt. Matt Ella. Two Matts. Yeah, exactly. One. Uh, tell us who you are. I'm Matt. I'm known around YouTube and Instagram as The Whiskey Nerd. I have myself a little YouTube channel where I review whiskeys and make whiskey cocktails because what I like doing is showing off how good and versatile whiskey can be. You make cocktails, you have a bit of fun, you can introduce friends to whiskey who aren't maybe the biggest fans of whiskey to begin with. You can really show off how versatile it can be. So we're going to sit down now for the Middle Cut, a brand new podcast series looking at the conversation of Irish whiskey. So we're not sitting down with distillers right now. We're not sitting down formally reviewing whiskeys we leave that to the whiskey nerd uh channel um what we are doing is talking about the industry in general um so it's the beginning of 2023 yeah it is an exciting time in irish whiskey absolutely uh, there's a lot of bottles behind you as well of, of fun exciting right brands there. we see them from all over um i suppose from your point of view for the people out there that don't know you um as the whiskey nerd where did the whiskey nerd come from uh, and I suppose, when did you start the channel? How, well, where are you long now? Because I think you're, you're up to a pretty decent number of subscribers on YouTube. It's, it's definitely grown. It's definitely taken on a bit of a life of its own. So it started off kind of, I, I'm in a running club where it's mostly more about the drinking of the beer than the actual running of the races. So it's called the Mickler Running Club. And there's a few friends there and they were like, oh, we like craft beer. We like craft beer. We enjoy it. But whiskey's just too damn expensive. And I said, well, hang on a second. A nice bottle of whiskey can set you back, what, 60 euro. You get about 20 drinks out of that. And I said, well, look, that's actually cheaper than, than your craft beer. So it's not actually that expensive. And they said, well, I don't know what's a good whiskey. I don't want to spend 60 euro, get a whiskey, find I don't like it and have wasted all that money and then have a bottle on the shelf. You're not going to know what to do with it. So I said, well, look, I've got a bit, bunch of whiskey at home. I am in the middle of a pandemic now. So why not start myself a little review channel and start making, you know, reviews and then run Rose, my lovely wife, the whiskey noob. She started getting into some cocktails kind of through the pandemic. We had like a couple of cocktail making classes. And I said, well, look, ver whiskey is a pretty versatile spirit. Let's make some whiskey cocktails. And it just kind of has grown from there. So on the channel, what do you do? Do you, do you review uh, whiskeys together on your own? Yeah, How does so, it work? So when uh, I, I'll, I'll do most of the reviews, Rose will be along for most of the whiskeys that she likes, the whiskeys she enjoys drinking. She will, of course, pop along and say, I insist on having this. We just did one there this week where we... Uh, reviewed the teeling which was finished in Amberana cask which mm -hmm. she picked up she was going through Gatwick she had a little uh, look at all the supplies there she tried out the uh, teeling finished in the Amberana wood cask and she said I'm getting a bottle of this came home popped open the bottle immediately said here I'm pouring you a little of this drank it and said I'm reviewing this whiskey and she's like yeah so she pops on for the whiskeys and the cocktails she likes I do most of the review and I do a lot of the setup and stuff but she's very helpful on actual the editing the kind of the behind the scenes work for even when she's not in front of the camera behind every strong man is a very strong woman <laughs> <laughs> exactly so i suppose how did you get into whiskey then in the terms of you said you had a collection you said you started reviewing but what what, what i suppose kicked that off for you was the thing you've always been interested in was it was it a pandemic yeah. pursuit well so i'm the youngest of four and my oldest brother is He's 10 years older than me, and he had himself a little small whiskey collection. I was growing up, I wasn't stealing his whiskey, but I was definitely looking at it and going, that's something that's a bit cool. That's a bit, looks a bit fun. So I've always been interested in it. I've always been a bit interested in the idea behind whiskey, the technical, you know, kind of you're building the whiskey, you're making the whiskey, you go from the grains all the way through into the glass. I've always been interested in it. And then when the pandemic kicked off, I said, look, I've got, you know, time. I'm at home. I'll just start drinking more whiskey and enjoying it because I wasn't going to pubs anymore. That's very fair. And when you were starting off, where did you get your information from? You were you're obviously searching online. Was it the, through the likes of Irish Malts, or did the beginnings of the pandemic with the kind of you know multitudes mm -hmm. of live streams, of which I am guilty? Yeah. Um, where where did you where did you get your inspiration from? So it was through like people like the Whiskey Tribe, obviously Ralphie, obviously you know there's there's, there's some God, great Ralphie. Some great people out there who will review fantastic whiskies. And then through like services like Three Drams, like Irish Malls do, the, the Three Drams thing where you get to taste a bunch of different whiskies 
So again, it, it saves you on that outlet. You can go, oh, I like this whiskey. I don't like that whiskey. Build up your collection and just kind of keep going from there. And that's kind of where it started. And it's it's grown. I've got like 200 bottles on my shelves now at this point. And I don't think it's going to be stopping anytime soon. And how how many followers have you got on YouTube now? It's up to like 1,700 and something. I think it's close to 1,800 now. That's a decent. That's a decent. It's a decent, decent stretch. Yeah, you'll get your you'll get your first advertising check yet. Oh, well, <laughs> one day. <laughs> uh, so, looking at I suppose Irish whiskey in twenty twenty three, um, there's a lot of distilleries out there. There's a lot of brands out there. Um, I suppose we were both I suppose kicking off mm-hmm. where where we came up with I suppose sitting down on this on this podcast idea. We were both at the um. Boan launch of the, yes. their their third anniversary birthday, um, that was quite an interesting experience. Great night for a, uh, I suppose it, not. A, well, I was going to say fledgling distillery, but a three year old distillery, um, a brand. Spirit. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, I do have that bottle behind here, um, as you can see, um, not out of its lovely velvet bag uh, just yet. But maybe I'll. Uh, what did you think of that night? Um, as I untie this and see if it was a great and it was actually really I think really symbolic of where Irish whiskey is going in this year because for for those of you who aren't from Ireland and you're watching this Ireland gets pretty darn dark in the winters I think um there's what like 18 hours of night at you know in, in the dead in the dead of winter and this whiskey was launched on the solstice and it's called the solstice which is the shortest day of the year on the 21st of December so it kind of does signify that darkest point of the year going into the light going into the new year every day seven extra minutes of light into the day and so <laughs> it's great it's a great little symbolic gesture of like oh here we are at the darkest point where there weren't that many distilleries there weren't that many brands and now we're going into the point where oh look there's new brands there's new distilleries there's new kind of spirits coming up on stream and that's really good because that'll force a lot of change in the industry so as it may have been seen, I hadn't opened this bag yet because on the night they were obviously sampling these whiskeys. I will say this is not for resale. This was a, a gift on the night for the attendees. It is the first uh, three-year-old whiskey from Bowen Distillery. I didn't realize the, the inside of the bag is like a, a bronze uh, oh, fabric yeah. as well, which I think that's that's, uh, that's attention to detail right there. Um, fun, I suppose, fun part for me on this whiskey, uh, some people might know listening in, I used to work for Bowen Distillery um, and Michael Walsh, the head distiller, and myself um, actually filled this cask that um, was sampled um, on the winter solstice in 2019. Yeah, that makes sense. That checks out. Um, quick maths. Quick maths. Um, we, it, was, it was the Christmas party the night before at Boyan Distillery, mm-hmm. and um, Michael Walsh and myself uh, stayed in the town that night uh, to be in the distillery for about 9 a.m. the next morning to ensure that the casks uh, got filled on the solstice, um, much to much to revenue's confusion because it was a Saturday, um, and it was also the Saturday, or the last Saturday before Christmas. Um, and one of my favorite things was we were I needed some more extra water for for the process, um, and there was a reverse osmosis tank, an Oro tank of water, reverse osmosis, just kind of pure water, just H two and O. It's what you cut whiskey with. And I needed some extra water. We wasn't coming through the pump. Um, so I got a ladder and we got a siphon hose. <laughs> and I put the uh, pipe in the top of the RO tank. Yeah. And I got down and we had an IBC, a uh, big container. And I was trying to siphon water through this pipe to fill this IBC. The most hygienic of processes. It, yeah. Well, look, it's fine. I'm going to spare it. Don't worry about it. Um, and right as the water started to pour like yeah. come through the spigot revenue walked around the corner and all they're seeing is like me siphoning this like colorless spirit which looks like new make so she comes around and i was like it's it's water i was like i swear it's water i'm so sorry <laughs> it's like i wasn't doing anything illegal or suspicious but i looked oh, i didn't I, say that was definitely suspicious yeah exactly. <laughs> Maybe not illegal. um no but it was it was a, it was it was very nice to be able to work from i suppose the beginnings of of that filling that cask um all the way through to seeing it bottled um but the it was definitely some shindig they put on um, yeah. they're very very well known for the solstice dinners they usually do the, uh, like a zero electricity dinner so at night time it's all candlelit tables and then everything's cooked um over kind of open fires um but obviously that was put on hold for the pandemic so it was nice yes. to see a, a, re- a return of celebration like that because it was good probably yeah. 150 people there oh it was good and it was great to see the entire distilling team there 
being able to chat to the people they were sitting there on the tables and they were split up amongst different tables so you're actually able to chat to them and get to know what they were doing for the different processes how they were actually making the spirit and how they kind of see it going forward because like michael walsh he's the reason i think rose got into whiskey he's like the real reason because uh during the pandemic the blind pig which is a really really cool speakeasy bar here in dublin and um, they did a cocktail making class mm -hmm. where they paired three boan whiskeys or the whistler whiskeys with three different cocktails so they had michael talk through the whiskey that was being made and being used in the cocktail and then they had the actual cocktail maker make the cocktail and rose is like oh yeah i i like this now this is a bit fun so it's it is really cool to when you get people who are passionate about it and yeah. not just like telling you the marketing spiel like they'll go like oh there's one thing i don't like about this you know this this this, this cask it just keeps breaking on me and i really want to use it and it's different things you can see the passion there it's not just about you know we find the finest of casks like sometimes a cask breaks and that's a pain because sometimes they're shite sometimes they're shite <laughs> and you go oh no but then you can feel like it's not just oh we're just churning out whiskey it's like we want to make good stuff yeah um on that there's i suppose the topic of authenticity has been in in whiskey news recently and, and of of um of uh reporting those reports done in the us uh, on authenticity and distilling brands as well which i thought was quite interesting and one of the um things i found funny about the um report they're talking about it on whiskey cast as well um they said the more a brand tells you they're authentic the less people think they're authentic yeah. which is like the lady doth protest too much <laughs> yeah it's one of those things where if you look at you say oh small batch that's not a protective term you know you're looking for like Oh, if it, is it cast strength? Is it barrel proof? Is it straight bourbon? You know, you're, you're looking mm -hmm. for certain things, and it's like you're like, oh, I don't, I'm not seeing all these words, but I'm seeing authentic and true to craft and family lineage, and you're seeing a lot of it's like, mm, it's not really, it's more marketing than real. Yeah, and they were saying it was interesting. People have their own um, opinions as to what authentic means, you know. And when they were asking people in these in these large surveys in the states, um, they would try to see what because they'd say, they'd say to them, what what brands do you think are authentic? And they'd mm -hmm. name brands. They weren't telling them what the definition of authentic was authentic to you. Yeah. Um, so what what did you think uh, was authentic um, about it? And then usually they said uh, one of the kind of broader definitions was um, they said that they, they, they do what they say they do, if that makes sense. Yeah. So if you outwardly focus, say, we do this, we're, you know, grain to glass, corn to cork, whatever, grow our own grains, whatever, then people... And if you do it, people think that's very authentic, you know. Um, and I thought that was interesting that the they said actually in the US you see a lot of um kind of what do you call kind of no name brands um yeah. that would say like, Oh, we found this recipe in two hundred years of archives mm -hmm. from moonshiners and they said that that's a really overused trope, but apparently very not it may work with some people, but as a general kind of rule that kind of just blanket marketing um doesn't land as authentic um, and in particular they noted um, NDAs so this would have been a thing in the Irish industry in the mid 2010s in particular when Cooley was abundant um, in new brands it was pretty much the only place you could you could look and um, they people would have these NDAs about their spirit so they'd say where did your spirit come from and they go I, well you know it's a finest distillery but I can't I can't tell you and that was just like a really big turnoff to consumers, particularly in the kind of 2013, 2014 yeah. era when new brands were kind of kicking off. And you've got those like the mothership distilleries where you know, like, oh, it, it, if they're not saying where it's from, it's it's probably coming from there. Which yeah. It doesn't help people because then if you're looking at a lot of brands who are maybe they're making stuff, as you're saying, like it takes time growing barley, mashing it, making the whiskey, then aging the whiskey. And you're like, oh, I've got something good coming down the line, but I have to make a bit of money now. And you're like, oh, I'm trying to source from, let's say, Cooley or for somewhere like that. It can sometimes hurt consumers. You can say, oh, I don't want to buy from that brand. And then a few years later, when they come out with something good, it's like, oh, but the customer relationship isn't isn't there, unfortunately. Yeah, and that's one of the things, if you break that kind of trust or authenticity with consumers, yeah. it's very difficult to build in the first place, but it's almost impossible to rebuild if yeah. that's the case. Um, but it's funny as well, because the particularly the sourcing aspect is, is something that happens in every industry, but it's focused on a lot more, I think, in in certain industries in in ireland in particular in the us as well with the kind of pre prevalence of mgp yeah. um i can't remember what their new name is um but the, that kind of like people are, are inquisitive now and obviously you've the internet on your fingertips yeah. you, you consumers well. can find yeah. out things then and um, back in 2013 you know 
we'd have a distiller say it was an NDA. I can't tell you where it came from. And it was very simple. You could just ask them how many times it was distilled. And you'd know and, who it was. Yeah, yeah, it was Bushmills or Cooley. That was it. <laughs> you double distilled in Cooley and you triple distilled in Bushmills. And yeah. that was that was uh, as about as clear cut as you needed it to be. Um, but yeah, it was very, very interesting um, kind of time period. But as I said, brands, if they want to release something yeah. uh, brown today, because in the moment we're what 40 something distilleries in Ireland at this point yeah. making whiskey or um and lots more in planning um very few are over the, the three-year yeah. threshold yeah, so and then even at three years old it might not be the best spirit it might not be the best version of that spirit yeah be. so you, you might say oh it's three years old now but maybe give it six years it might be really good so again brands as you said getting something brown out the door and then getting something that's great out the door is, is different it's a different question exactly I think the the world might be so, Full of gin at this point. It's definitely full of gin. <laughs> Although uh, with Putin coming out in the market now, I, I, it's 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 it is enjoyable. And with Bar sixteen sixty one being that lighthouse up in the north side of Dublin, they make fantastic cocktails and they make great Putin cocktails. Yeah, Green Street. Yeah, it's a it's a oh, fantastic yeah. fantastic little place for sixteen sixty one. Um, definitely leading, particularly the Belfast coffee. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, for the man who Ooh, loves Irish coffees. coffees yeah. Belfast coffee is a fantastic twist on that. Um, I do remember talking about Putin and like globally looking at markets. Um, and a few years ago, there was a bar opening up, I think in Austin, Texas, or in Houston, Texas. I can't remember one or the other. Um, and it was called Putin. Right. And it was this uh, Irish guy. I was, he would have been kind of prevalent in some of the like UK uh, hospitality groups, I think. I'm trying to remember who it was. But opening this bar called Putchin, um, and it's kind of a semi-controlled state system. Texas is very funny with their laws. Yeah. Um, and then it was realized, I guess, like three quarters of the way through, um, there was actually no Putchin on sale in Texas. <laughs> so it yeah. was it was a um, a search then, I think, after naming and opening, or at least like three quarters of the way coming through naming this bar called Putchin, uh, to try to find some Putchin. Yeah, um, and it is an interesting spirit because it's like, it's that bit cleaner than like gin. But it's still like got that more fruity, floral, kind of earthy aromas than you'd expect in like a vodka. So it is, it does have a place and it does. Like I was in uh, Brussels there during the week and a few of the bars have put in behind the counter. So it is interesting to see like the push abroad, like see what they can do with it because it's one of those spirits that's kind of niche. You still see people, they think, oh, is it just like moonshine? Like there's a spirit from Puerto Rico, I think it's called uh, Pitoro, which is very similar to Putin. It's kind of like the idea of like a rum, but it's just, it's just been kind of made through sort of certain kind of processes similar to a Putin, but it's not used anywhere. It can be a very niche spirit to find. So it's definitely an interesting place to see where I know, um, was it Brendan Carty christened 2022 year of the Putin, <laughs> but I think uh, 2023 might also see more. Well, I, I think so. Yeah, it's it's definitely. Um, I know a lot of people are kind of akin it to mezcal uh, mm -hmm. as well. That kind yeah. of direction, that 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 flavor profile. Obviously, not. It can be uh, earthen and spicy yeah. and and smoky. I guess uh, in the mezcal style, but um, maybe for U.S. consumers, you know, one of the problems with categoryless yeah. spirits like and that Puchin has its category. Yeah, but for people that don't know it. If you give someone a you know liqueur, it's very difficult to know what to do with it, um, and I think that's one thing with Puchin having a benchmark of yeah. say mezcal or an, an akin spirit that you can peg yourself to that way um, helps I think consumers that that way because there's brands out there um, that I've worked for internationally that have massive like if they're in they're in fifty five percent of the accounts in the country. 85% of the people, their target market, know the brand name mm -hmm. and they only go through like 0 0.04 cases per year per account. Like no one knows how to, you, you talk yeah. about these liqueurs or these spirits and you say, yeah, I know that, yeah, I know what Pisco yeah. is. And then they go, cool, how do you drink Pisco? And they I go, don't uh, I don't know. When uh, the, was it the paper plane took off in popularity? Everyone bought a bottle of Amaro Nonino and it just sits on the shelves like, oh, um, what do you use that for? Uh, paper planes, what else? Paper planes. Yeah, paper planes, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want a rusty now? No? Okay. Uh, I don't I don't know what to use this remedy for. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, and that's the thing was when when you have that, like things like um Aperol led the way yeah. with an amazing uh as a term or uh, as in terms of drinks marketing strategies, they picked a single serve, which has in in the kind of category list 
realm of liqueurs and, and drinks like that, the single serve is 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 king essentially. Um, the Aperol spritz. Yeah. If you say Aperol to anybody, they think they think spritz, spritz. Yeah. because I I even to this day I have no idea what else to you know use it. Mm-hmm. Well, what most people are going to yeah. use it. You know what what other cocktail are people going to be able to call that has Aperol in it? There's loads of cocktails you can use Aperol in, but very few that but, require. Well, also yes, exactly. Um, Jägermeister in Jäger bombs, yeah. uh, massive trend uh, globally uh, still to this day. Some bad memories. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. There's a few other um, like Pisco has the sour, but it's very funny. I I've been speaking to some people that make and, and sell Pisco, and globally they're trying to get past the sour. sour they're yeah. they're trying to to showcase the spirit a little bit more because again, they needed the single serve to get into bars and popularity in bars. Um, and in people's minds, but they now want to evolve past that very much in the same way Irish whiskey was and is shots, particularly in yeah. the States. Um, and then you got the whiskey and ginger, the mules, that's the Irish mule whiskey and ginger. It's simple, but if you want to have go into something where it's more elevated, you can definitely do that. So you got the whiskey sour classic, but. And we, but you got whiskey old fashions. You got you got to do have a good. Yeah, but yeah, again, they they, they they yeah. you that's a call. You yeah. know, you don't. Uh, if you're in the states, you'll more likely see a a, a rail bourbon yeah. in there. Um, whereas, like, if you go and obviously, I've spent I spent time working in whiskey in the states. People go into bars and they look at the the beer menu and they go, "I'll have a oh, uh, uh, give me a shot of JMO and I'll figure it out." You know, and that's just like this call thing that it's just. It's just Irish whiskey is the shot. And it's very funny for me because even coming from a cocktail background and bartending background years ago, um, over a decade ago, but, um, you know, there's a certain, you know, if you're a certain type of bar, if you're in a normal yeah. bar, not a, like a high end bar, the rail, you know, speed rail in a bar will have appropriately priced spirits in it. Yeah. You know, you're going to have your, your low end bourbon, your low end vodka, but in the States, Jemison is always in the well. Oh, it gets know. called so frequently. You just have to have it. That just haven't in the well. But it's like it's like twenty five dollars more expensive than the rest of the bottles in in the yeah. well. Um, obviously, when you get into more expensive places, you get more expensive vodkas and all that kind of stuff. But um, it is a very interesting dynamic to see. And it's funny because I talk about this on occasion with people that work in the whiskey industry. We're in a microcosm of our own popularity, if that makes yeah. sense. Irish whiskey is very popular in Ireland. Yes, very popular. Um, <laughs> Who'd have guessed? Yes. But, and we think that we're the bee's knees and the cat's pajamas, but you get outside of Ireland and just, it, 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 it becomes, you know, I've, I've had conversations recently with uh, distributors in Germany and stuff who are asking me about Irish whiskey and doing Irish yeah. whiskey trainings and stuff like that. And they said, oh, we have um, one Irish whiskey. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like, um, you know, if you want to know anyone else i can connect you with producers in in ireland or whatever and they said turn everyone we, we have one irish whiskey why would i need two yeah um and that that's a that's a thing that i had experienced in the mid 2010s and i kind of thought we were past that but it's still there. but it's still very prevalent you still see like as well like if people are like oh where do i go to get into irish whiskey people don't generally say oh you can kind of start anywhere there's so many brands it's it's green spot or it's red breast, red breast. It's, it's very simple like oh it's those are still and they're coming from the same distillery. Yeah, yeah. Even though we've got so many more coming out of Spain. Well, it's funny. Someone, someone said this to me a few years ago. It was a bar manager in Dublin. He said, um, "Go in any bar in Dublin and ask the bartender that you need a, a a nice whiskey. What's your favorite whiskey? What's your, you know your favorite nice whiskey?" He said almost hundred percent of the time they'll say Redbreast. Yeah. And he goes, "Name your second favorite whiskey." He said everyone will struggle. Yeah. And he said it's the power of and the not the power, but the re- the amazing work that the prestige team in Irish distillers yeah. has even even myself, anyone else, like I'm not saying Redbreast isn't good. Redbreast is clearly right. fantastic. But it's so funny that no one thinks Jemison 18, no one thinks Bushmills 10. Yeah. It's Redbreast 12, Redbreast 12, Redbreast 12. And mm-hmm. we've it's a, like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It is really good. And then they tell us it's really good. And then we all think it's, it's really, really good. good. And, and it is really good. And so you drink it, why would you recommend it? It's one of the things where I always get people like on, on the YouTube and stuff, they'll say like, oh, what kind of whiskey should I get into? Like, like some of these whiskeys I can't find outside of Ireland. So they say, oh, what can I go? And I'm like, I don't want to say Redbreast, but Redbreast. Redbreast. Yeah, it's it's it's, hard, it's really hard not to say it because it is such 
a good whiskey. It's also iconic of style in that sense yeah. that of of the available pot stills out there, which there are few, but gaining uh, yeah. with the new distilleries, um, it is obviously yeah. it is fine in the price point, mm. and it is extra fine in the bottle. Yeah, and coming um, in at even at forty percent, like you do get some people say, "Oh, if it's you know, if it's less than forty-five, less than forty-six percent." Why would I bother drinking it? The pot still style does lend it that little bit of oiliness, a little bit of richness, and at forty percent, it can deliver a lot of flavor without being so strong, so harsh. It's not beginner friendly, so it is just exactly one bottle. I do want to want to talk about here. I'll give you I'll give oh, you this one here now. You can you can show this off to the camera. So this is the Jameson Single Pot Still Five Oak release which is a very interesting kind of whiskey because there's not many Jamesons that are pot still and kind of hold up there. There aren't many pot still Jamies on the market still. No Even man. though like you, you do, they do have pot stills, they do make pot still whiskey. They obviously. make red breast. They make red breast, but there aren't many pot still whiskeys in the Jameson kind of family that they advertise being purely pot still. Well, no, the last one would have been Millennium, the Jameson yeah. 15, huge cult following to this huge day. Huge cult following. Um, there were some limited releases for the um, Middleton Club, um, yeah. But but as for core releases, this is the the first Jemison uh, pot still. I did have a full size bottle, uh, but I drank that, um, so I had to go find my sample find bottle. Sample. I uh, one of my one of my one of my good friends. He, he's moving away uh, for a little while, and he said, "Oh, what kind of whiskey should I, should I have? Should I bring with me?" I gave him a bottle of that. So it's good. It's nice. It's also uses interestingly Irish oak. Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of Irish oak. I mean, and we're not going to get into the, the history. That's not this kind of podcast. Deforestation. Not, deforestation. But there's not that many trees in Ireland. Unfortunately, that means we can't use Irish oak. And it does lend a very interesting note to mm -hmm. whiskey because different oaks will give you different kind of flavors. And it's interesting to see the influences had there. Even though it's only probably a small amount of the whiskey has been aged in Irish, it does stand out because you're not used to tasting that influence. And it has this kind of a kind of vanilla buttercream kind of note to it. Yeah, I find this interesting because it's it's only released at the moment in Ireland. I think the UK or it's, it's yeah. and maybe GTR. Um, it, it's a small GTR would be global travel retail for those of us who aren't industry folks. There you go, good man, catching out the jargon. <laughs> um, the so it's a it's a small initial release, but tasting it because obviously when it was funny because um, I was at the launch of this um, and Barry Chandler from Stories and Sips and myself. Yeah. Uh, we're standing side by side and I actually think I slow on money. Um, we put a bet on about what we thought it was going to be. Yeah. Um, and we, he said, he said, uh, he thought it was going to be a Jemison pot still. And I was like, no, Jemison's not the pot still brand. I was like, I think we're going to do like a cast strength or a, like a return of the Jemison 12 or something like that. Because we all got invited to this event. It was in this Victorian home in, in, uh, right on Leeson street bridge. Um, but the thing was, all these people got invited from across Europe, UK, Ireland, um, and none of, I mean, like, there was nothing. There was no whispers about what this was going to be. So we were, com and it's fun because yeah, it's very rarely do they get to pull, does any brand get to pull one out these days without someone seeing it coming? Yeah, because, um, because they have to submit the labels. And there's one whisky we might talk about later, a new release from Powers that everyone knew was coming. It was one of those open secrets because you have to submit the I registered it with TPTB to, in the yeah, States. It's a yeah. registered label so you know what's coming out, you know yeah. what they're making ahead of time. And so it was because it was only released in Ireland. Yeah. They could keep it ghost, keep it quiet. And, you know. Yeah. I, I think it's very interesting. It's it's a, in my, well, as you said, five oak release. Um, obviously showing this to the camera, but for those at home uh, who are listening on audio format only, um, it is said the Jemison single pot still five oak release. This will at some point make it towards the state supposedly. And yeah. I imagine why wouldn't it? It would be a great launch point mm -hmm. for bringing consumers who are those JMO one shot consumers into the fold of pot still where they can graduate later up to, up to the, the likes of. It isn't even that much more expense. Like, I mean, it's around the same price point you talk and as red breast, as green spot comes in at 46%. That was a good pop. That was a really good pop. For a small yeah. bottle, that's a good pop. That was, yeah. That's yeah. a, yeah. Oh, that was nice. Yeah. That's a, it's, yeah. It's bourbon, sherry, Irish oak, American oak, virgin oak, and it says European oak, so I imagine that's French oak. Is, I can't remember what they said on what on night, but I think it is French oak, yeah. Yeah, because Spanish um, would give much more, I, I, I love wood influence, and I, I'm a little beaver, you know, for looking at things like that, and Spanish oak gives um really kind of like pine sap, pine needle kind of vibes. 
There you go. Just wanted to do that. Yes. Time. French Oak gives you kind of more chocolatey, deep vibes, and I think that's what that's what we got. This is funny because when on the night um, we were, um, it's, it was uh, Kevin O'Gorman was was leading our group um, in the tasting of this. It was funny because they were talking a lot about those virgin oaks, the the, uh, the vanilla, and a lot of that kind of toasted wood influence as well, very akin to the um, the palates of American consumers in that kind of sweet profile. And it was funny tasting it because if they'd said this is a U.S. exclusive only. That would have made total. I was like, yeah, okay, this makes total sense in my head because this will, this will, in my opinion, suit the American palate very well. This isn't a criticism of American palates. Europe and America have different palates in terms of of uh, flavors of whiskey, and a lot of whiskey, large whiskey companies, will yeah. alter their flavor profiles between Europe and the U.S. But I think this will be, if and when it launches in the states, I think it will be a a big hit. I think it'll be, as you said, an appropriate price point to bring yeah. people up. Um, and I think a flavor profile. Yeah. If they buy it once, I think the, for the price it, yeah. point, they'll buy it again yeah. for the flavor. Because it's it is it's surprisingly sweet, despite it's a pastel whiskey. I mean, like obviously bourbon, I mean majority corn, it's gonna be quite sweet, kind of caramelly, and it does have enough of that virgin oak influence that it captures that kind of spiciness, the kind of bite that you might get in in a bourbon. So definitely, I think yeah, it would, it would be odd if it didn't see an American release. Yeah, I think the initial batch, I think the initial bottles had batch one 2022. So obviously they're planning batches of releases of it maybe into 2023 and beyond. So it might be that there's one batch for Ireland, one batch for let's say Europe, one batch for the States. Yeah. And that use of, of uh, Irish oak, um, I'm pretty sure is going to be why that's a batch system. Yeah. Um, we don't have an overabundance. No. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of processes and systems that go into uh, getting Irish oak and, and very few distilleries in Ireland have the, the yeah. means uh, because everything has to be felled very sustainably. Um, yeah. And then oak has to dry yeah, for um, a ridiculously long time. I remember talking to one distiller who uh, he was he was he had he, he has a family farm and he has a couple of oak trees that are in danger of falling over and he's just hoping one day that there is a that there's a storm and the oak trees <laughs> fall over because that way he can use them because yeah. otherwise he wouldn't be allowed to fell them because they're just historical and you, you mm -hmm. just you can't be destroying them for that. Yeah, yeah it's funny in the in the states, you know, you talk to the distillers the american white oak forest through yeah. kind of the appalachians and whatnot on the eastern side of the us those oak trees grow in a like a 40 to 80 year period yeah. where in you know aggressive growing seasons irish oak trees reach maturity around 200 years yeah. so it's a, it's a it's a different <laughs> scale yeah, yeah as i po poke this wall of american oak behind me here yeah um but yeah so what do you think of the the likes of this excuse me this new powers the the, the, the rye evolution, uh, I, I think, is what the, you call the rye evolution. I do love a, a yep. good pun, and I really love a bad pun. <laughs> 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 the worse, the better. Yeah, this uh, Powers rye. It's interesting because it's hundred percent rye, and we've seen rye in Irish whiskey, obviously with uh, uh, Fanon O'Connor. He's he's a, a whiskey historian. I think he started out as a regular historian, has become a whiskey historian. Um, the kind of idea of rediscovering Irish whiskey where rye was used in historical context where you'd have a postal whiskey that has like a large rye inclusion and it's rare enough to see such a high rye inclusion i mean in american bourbons you'd see some bourbons will have rye inclusion you see a, a rye whiskey is of course over there but it's very rare i'd think to see a 100 percent rye where it's just rye just plain rye and nothing to temper it especially in ireland yeah, I think it's the I mean, first. Has it? Is the first one? Of it's the, the first. It's the first whiskey released, and it's 100 percent uh, rye. Yeah. Um, I know that in Cologne they distilled uh, almost 100 percent rye mash. Yeah. Um, it was going to be 100 percent rye. Rye is a very interesting grain to work with, and not very many people in Ireland have worked with it. Um, just for it's not less than abundance um, in growing. It's used as a kind of a cover crop. They grow it in in regeneration of fields, and then they. Yeah. The farmers will plow it back into the ground and then grow something else on top of it. Um, Brendan Carty in the early days tried to make a hundred percent rye, and I think it ended up as a ninety-five percent rye, five yeah. percent malt, um, just for for diastatic and and sieving purposes. Um, I have a bottle here behind your head, and this is a Bowen Distillery uh, New Make Distillate bottle. Let's see if I get that. I'm holding it to the wrong camera here. Um, this was a distillate for uh contract is still for two stacks mm -hmm. um and this is 50 percent malt and 50 percent unmalted rye okay um so that was um in oh it's almost it's, it's actually just past its birthday 27th of the first 22 okay. um 
And this is at that time would have been one of the. So I don't know about because I believe from the press releases and things that were talked about online, the Harris rye is a column distilled rye. It looks like yeah. So it's it would be classified under a single grain at that point. Um, but it'd be the first one to use. That was a good sound of the car. Well, have a little, These little bottles are doing well. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um. So that'd be the column distilled. Um. I know that. Was that there? I know that um, Bali Keefe had been using rye for a while as well. Um, I don't know if they're using 100% rye though. Um, but the this is one of the few pots still 100% rye. I know that have been yeah. used uh, or produced. Uh, nice. It had a nice bit of spiciness. It, rye has this kind of I don't know, not minty, but kind of herbal. Herbal. Kind of no, yeah. Kind of note to it, kind of the eucalyptus note sometimes. And it'd be very interesting as well. Because it launched in America first. It launched, I think, as a 750 mil bottle. We're not going to see that here. We're going to see our, our 700 mil bottles. But it'd be, yeah, it'd be pretty illegal if they did that. Yeah. So I think we're going to see a lot of cocktails, especially in advance of St. Patrick's Day. Um, I was talking to someone on uh, on YouTube, and I think the cocktail name of choice might be the Irish built Manhattan. You make an Irish, you make a Manhattan with iron. Yeah. And I think that'll be, it'll be a good launch time for it. A very distinctive kind of green bottle, green. It's, yeah, it's a green, it's the green powers yeah. uh, diamond, which was interesting. Um, I w I'd like to see, I'd like to try it. Um, yeah. I have, uh, I did, I did chat to someone last night who tried it in Dublin. Oh, um, in the uh, Temple Bar Whiskey uh, Emporium. I don't know the shop. I'm not really sure the. Um, I don't know if it's meant to be released yet or they just got some mates' rights and they they dipped in. Um, but they said it was very enjoyable. Um. Kind of, a, I think they said uh, rock candy spun spun sugar flavoring to it. So okay. and that was one of the things I was interested in. Um, was what angle Irish sellers will take on it? Will they take because previously we had the Kilbegan rye, which I think was thirty or twenty percent rye yeah. uh, in the inclusion, which would kind of a, essentially when I think it was originally distilled, it was defined as a pot still, and then mm. uh, the new definition of pot still came in, which had five percent. Yeah, it, it just declassified it as a pot still. Um, but that was very much matured in the kind of traditional kind of pot still sense. Yeah. It was a dry palette. And I think when people out there saw rye on the label, you do what, what people do. And you think of right. what's the flavor profile of a rye and you think American rye, you think the Sazerac, you think, um, anything along those kind of spiced lines. So I'll yeah. be interested to see whether our stillers leaned into the kind of virgin oak American style sweetness. Yeah you know little wood spice or if they've gone for more of that kind of tempered uh european style palette yeah because it would be it would be odd if they launched a u.s product that wasn't what a u.s kind of consumer might Expect, imagine a rye would yeah. be so I, I, it might have gone, gone 50 50 with some bourbon cask some previously used cask and then a virgin cask and give it that traditional kind of spice in its palette you'd expect yeah it'd be it'd be interesting to see it'd be interesting to see how the, the u.s consumers React to it. React to it. I think it, it's already available there. It, it was is, launched yeah. on the 31st of January. I've seen uh, a few of the pages online with people very excited with their purchases already. Yeah. So I think I think it's definitely definitely something that is 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 available. And uh, I think I don't know. I think this one we're going to see a lot of. It's it was for it's 40 euro. I think it's like okay. 35 dollars, 33 dollars or something. So it's yeah. it's definitely in the affordable price point. Yeah. Definition, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's going to be something that we'll, we'll definitely pick up, particularly ahead of St. Patrick's Day with a big green label. Big green label, always, always sell. Like the big green bottle with with uh, Jameson is always a big, yep. big hit. Yeah, so big green label. Is uh, supposedly, as as the uh, story goes, it was um, the main reason that Pernod Ricard chose Jameson as the lead brand. Yeah, as a green bottle. Green bottle. There you go. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Um, I suppose so. From from your look at twenty twenty three. Uh, at the whiskey market, what are you thinking? What are we going to be seeing? What are your thoughts uh, from both uh, the whiskey nerd and also, I suppose, from your your wife's perspective as the whiskey noob? Yeah. You know, you got have you almost have a, a consumer in your household, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I'm a consumer uh, too. Yes, I know, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I yeah, I don't, I think it'd be unfair to call you a general consumer in that yeah. sense that you, we pick up bottles and see things that people won't see as yeah. a as a Joe Bloggs consumer. You know, I was in the states once and I had someone. Uh, staying with us and they went to the store to pick up uh, like a six case of Bud Light or something and they came back with a bottle of vodka and there was like 10 of us in the house and none of us drank vodka and I yeah. was like why the why, why the fuck did you buy a bottle of vodka and he goes 
pointed to an award on the bottle and he was like, look, it was the best vodka in the world. He was like, I had to buy it. Yeah. And I was like, some awards I've never heard of at some vodka I've yeah. never heard of. And that's, you know, that's that's the general consumer. Whereas the two of us be sitting there going, oh, look at these awards. Yeah, award what, from, yeah. Yeah. I think it'll be interesting because, again, I got to go back to a little bit of what we were talking about earlier with the kind of the sourcing of whiskey. Like we've got bottlers, we've got brand, what are they called, uh, bonders. We've got a lot of brands like you've got JJ Carr, you've got Two Stacks, you just mentioned there. Fantastic whiskeys coming down the line. And especially with distilleries now getting their spirit to three years old. You mentioned the the Boan distillery when there was on contract for two stacks. So I think we're going to see a lot more of this, maybe a little bit of like Scotchification. We have, you know, Scotch blended whiskey. You can sometimes take whiskeys from multiple distilleries. Mm -hmm. I'd like, and I think it would be a good thing to see some bonders and some bottlers taking whiskey from different kind of distilleries and combining flavor profiles to see something good. Like you think of that Dingle DNA with that kind of herbal, lovely botanical note in their single malt. If you combine that with maybe a bit of spiciness from somewhere else, like a pot still maybe distilled from Boan, you could have some really interesting flavor profiles that kind of take the best of both worlds. Yeah. I mean, I know some distilleries are doing that where they're they're sourcing from GD and West Cork and there's some Cooley and there's some Bushmills and you're creating, you know, products that are differentiated so they don't taste like other distilleries. And that is a, a kind of a core precedent of any brands I, I work with as well. Um but when it comes to like those, you know, brands and bonders, yeah. some, I think two stacks are a great example because what they're doing is they're branching out and reaching out to yeah. distilleries and they're saying, okay, right now our products are all g and yeah. like 15 other bonders and brands and whatnot. And yeah. they're going out and contract distilling or they're uh, s sourcing casks from other distilleries yeah. to set up their future. Yeah profile and they can the, build this kind of flavor library where they have okay they know what this brand is you know what this and they they have not just the whiskey but the casks themselves yeah. so they can take a cask and say oh actually we'll hold on to this for a while i've got something here i think that will work really well in a couple of years time and they can exactly. hold with their warehouse i think that's a very interesting kind of path forward I'm looking to see where they go forward with that yeah. yeah well i think that's absolutely fantastic i take this point yeah. say a very big thank you to our sponsors irishmalts.com as i said go to their website check out their fantastic range of Irish whiskeys, gins, and puchins, and they will deliver straight to your door anywhere in the world that it is legal to do so. Um, I know that there are some people in Brazil, Japan, Australia, and uh, the very remote regions of Canada uh, that get very regular shipments from um, the guys in Irish malts. They do ship elsewhere. They're just places I think would be more difficult to ship to than others. Um, but a very big thank you to them. Um, Matt, to you, thank you so much for, for joining me here today. And uh, we'll catch you um, and everyone else at home on the next episode of The Middle Cut, Irish Whiskey in Conversation. Sponsor.